We have the ability to envision. The very first time you, you saw your wife, you envision her naked. Praise God. And all the men said amen. I'm not saying it was right, but you had vision. You had vision. And even if she rejected you multiple times, like how Julie rejected me the first five times I asked you out, I had a vision that said she will be my wife, and that vision was so strong and so potent that even though she rejected me the first five times, the vision was saying no, that continue to persist, and I wore you down, we got coffee, I made you laugh so hard, coffee came out of your nose. Some of you single people, the reason why you're, why you're still single is because you're not funny. <laughs> Stop dumping your problems on the first date and oversharing. You look like a weirdo. Well, well. And then some of you married people that's like, man, why is my marriage? Like, listen, have fun in your marriage. Become a best friend. And really for Julie, the first time that she allowed me to take her on this date and we were laughing together, it was like she then, when, it, when she was laughing and that, that coffee, that Starbucks came through her nostrils, she blew her nose and then she looked up at me and she's like, I think I found him. <laughs> so she started to get vision, maybe he is my husband. And see, when you start with that vision, the vision that leads you down the aisle to get married it's not a vision of you suffering in your physical body with physical illness. It's not a vision of you living in poverty and scraping by and not being able to pay your bills. It's not a vision of you be having a sexless marriage where you guys you know, have no passion. That's not what got you to that aisle or this ju justice of the peace, depending on where you were at in that season of your life. But the vision that you had was this is going to be, do you remember when we used to get together and we would say, man, one of these days we're never gonna have to be apart? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you want me to talk about it? Well, I just thought, I was so into what you were saying. I was like, <laughs> I'm learning. Well, well, the vision, I think for us, it was like I had vision for you, you did not have vision for me. I broke through that barrier. <laughs> then you had vision for me. And then we were just obsessively with each other and it was like we could not get married fast enough, yep. and that was part of the vision. So I wanna go back. A lot of times when couples come to us for marriage counseling and they're on the verge of divorce, the very first thing Julie and I do is we say, tell us how you first decided that you wanted to get married. And when people start to share that story, it rekindles that fire and that passion, and we start seeing tears well up, and then grace begins to flow, humility comes over these people, and then they look at each other and they go back. You know, David, when he fought Goliath, had to go back and rehearse, he delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the bear, surely you'll deliver me from the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. Sometimes the way that you kill that big giant in front of you is remembering the little victories you had before it came. And so it was like, sometimes when we, when we meet with people, the way that we'll cancel a divorce is saying, but wait a second, there was a time where it wasn't always like this. Mm -hmm. There was a time where, where things did work. And so what was it like for you in those early days with like the vision that we had for our marriage? Because it wasn't soon after we got married that all that vision crumbled. Yeah, so you're talking about, okay, so when we first got together, I remember, okay, so we were dating, right? We were in college. And um, he was obsessed with me. <laughs> Rar. <laughs> like, put the wig on again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so he just wanted to be, like, we wanted to be around each other all the time. But then, like, over time, I wanted that same thing. And so I remember I was in college, and he was getting ready to go away to school you know, back to college, and I, you know, went to college near my house, and so we were going to be apart, and I was just like, I would just think about it, and just thinking about it, I would have like one singular tear. Y'all know that Taylor Swift moment, you know what I'm saying, when you're like, you, the song comes on the radio, and you're like, I am her right now. Like, I'm desperate, you know, to be together. And so um, I was getting ready to go on a vacation, and so it was going to put us apart a few days earlier than, you know, whatever, because it was the way our family vacation fell. Well, there was a hurricane, and I was 
so happy that our vacation got canceled because I got to be, like, the whole world was in crisis, and I didn't even care because I was so in love. I was just like, oh, I'm so glad we get a couple more days. It's like, who thinks like that? Like, I wasn't even thinking like a human being, you know? I was so self-centered. But it's you're, when you're in love and, and it's new and it's fresh, you forget about all the calamity around you. You don't think about not having any money. You don't think about, you know, um, a toilet being broke. And what happens, I think, the familiarity in marriage, you start treating your spouse as familiar as That's you treat it. your couch. When you first got that couch, what did you tell your kids? Don't you eat on that couch. <laughs> Fast forward five years, you are wiping the barbecue sauce <laughs> off on the side of the couch where you put the pillow. Y'all know who's with me. And so it's like we get into those seasons of familiarity and all of a sudden the newness of our love it, it got to a point in our marriage where I never wanted him to come home. I would pray, I hope he never comes home. I think you would pray, I hope he dies. I did. And that, that's a true story. I, I would literally pray, Lord, I, I hope, it, it's horrible. I hate to even say it, but that was really where my heart was, is I was like, God, I hope he just gets like, I don't know, hit by something. Or, because I didn't want to deal with the reality of what our life was like. I didn't want to face it. I was so broken from everything that had happened and we had become so familiar to one another and we really had to go back to that, um, that newness. Yeah. And that's intentional. That's not a feeling. And so even to this day, I'll buy things that have like a little M on them. And it's like, I'm 40. But I don't want it to get too familiar. Because if I was in high school, I'd be buying it. If I was in college, I'd be buying it. And so my effort is I don't ever want, you know, um, my kids' little crushes and things to be more exciting than God's gift to me. This is my gift. My treasure. And so I want that to be as exciting. And so it might look funny to you. I, I literally do not care. Take a hike. Because this is my treasure. We had to learn what you rehearse is what you repeat. You rehearse the pain, you repeat the pain. Come on. If you rehearse the trauma, you repeat the trauma. What you rehearse is what you repeat. And so we could just say, you hurt me, you hurt me, you hurt me. And every single time we rehearse the hurt, we repeat the hurt. But see, what happens was she said, well, I'm going to rehearse the, the beginnings of our relationship. I'm going to rehearse the times where we got along. And then I'm going to repeat what I rehearse. And so I'm going to act like a girlfriend so I can have girlfriend feelings. I, I'm going to act like a boyfriend so we can have boyfriend feelings. Do you remember the very first time that you actually held their hand? And it felt like electricity shooting through your body. Come on, girl. <laughs> I do. You know, so everybody here knows what I'm talking about. You're thinking about that right now. Okay, let's take it a step further. Do you remember the very first time that you kissed? Okay, that's somebody's just somebody's awkwardly giggling in the front. Over there. And I'm like, y'all are enjoying this way too much. I the, can't but even. the very first time that you kissed and you were like, because here's the thing, even on a biological level, your body knew this is it. Did you know that, that the body knows there's a chemistry, there's pheromones, there's hormones. This is so wired, and God is intimately weaving that story together. Can I just tell you that God created marriage so there's a special blessing on marriage? This was God's idea. When, when Adam was walking through the garden and said, God, I need companionship, God did not say, spend more time with me, Adam. You need to fast. You need to pray more. He actually said, I know you need a wife. And so sometimes God's prescription for us men is not even, you need to pray more. It's you need a companion. I know that desire that is going to be fulfilled by your Eve. And so God has destined us, unless you have the gift of singleness, to actually be joined together in oneness. And there's a special blessing. 
Did you know that the most uh, wealth generating institution on the planet is the marriage? Did you guys know that? More wealth is generated by virtue of the institution of marriage than any other institution on planet Earth. And so wealth is transferred. Legacy is created. So now you see why all hell breaks loose against a marriage because if the two will become one and begin to do what God called them to do, then they are unstoppable. Matter of fact, when Jesus compares the, his, his bride, he, it's, it's a wedding allegory because there's such an imagery between the groom and the bride and it's so important that you get that revelation. But to go forward, you gotta go back. The first Adam failed. And so God said, I must send my son Jesus as the second Adam. I've got to go back to where it failed. It failed on planet Earth. So I've got to now send my son to the same place of pain. Are are you getting this? And so guess what? Sometimes it's not finding another spouse. It's the same spouse healing the pain that they created. I'm trying to help somebody here. The first Adam failed, and so God didn't send us uh, um, an elephant. He didn't send us, come on, somebody, a penguin. It wasn't another species. It was humanity failed, so another man must come to redeem humanity. So what will happen is sometimes you think, well, I need to find another spouse, but it's like the person who has the capacity to heal you the most from the wounds of your spouse is your spouse. That's redemption. And so what Julie and I were learning is you've got to go backward to go forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Men, can I talk to you for a second? Okay, you're being real quiet. Men, men, I want you to go back to the vision that you had of starting a family leading your home, building a legacy. I want you to go back to the vision that you had. Men, I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you up higher now. Listen, a woman will miscarry a baby, but a man will miscarry a dream. A a woman will miscarry. We had two miscarriages. Julie and I had two miscarriages, and I remember the tragedy of losing that baby, and I I remember the second time it happened, and that baby had to be surgically removed from my wife. But see, I haven't experienced that, but I've experienced the miscarriage of a dream. And so many of you men, you had an expectation, and that expectation miscarried. And you're like, I didn't expect my wife to be nagging me all the time. I didn't expect for, you know, because a lot lot of what I'm saying right now is psychological. You know, the wife is the psycho and then the man is the logical. (laughs) Psychological. It took a turn. I just wanted to make sure you're still with me. You know, psychological. Oh, they're with (laughs) you. So a lot of times you're like, this makes sense in my logical mind. Why is it not making sense to her? Why are we arguing all the time? Why are we fighting all the time? Where's the passion gone? You know, and then her body changes after kids and it's not the same woman that you married physically. And then you get into the trap of scrolling through Instagram. I'm keeping it 100. But men, I want to go back to the original vision because the woman that you're looking at on Instagram does not deserve your eyes, especially the fact that her body hasn't borne your babies. So never give a woman attention that hasn't gone through the pain of bearing your babies. And so what happens is we end up in this world where we're like, I'm not sexually satisfied in my marriage, so I'm going to satisfy myself. And men, we, you did not get married for that. You, the vi- and I'm calling you back to that vision because the Bible actually says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. So I want God to exchange heart sickness for a tree of life. We talk about a family tree, and you trace your lineage into that family tree. Many of you have never inherited a godly, godly tree in your family because hope deferred, you actually inherited heart sickness. You've actually got, you know, when you go to the doctor, they'll tell you, they'll say, what do you have a family history of heart disease? And for many of you men, you have inherited a spiritual genetic heart disease, and you're 
your hope has gone deferred and the generations that have gone before you have been one mediocre marriage after another and you've got to become the generational curse breaker that says the heart sickness ends with me. And I, can I just tell you something about your wife's body? It's a reflection of your words to her. Because if you begin to prophesy to your wife, I'll never forget, you know, can, can I tell your story? Uh, you're going to tell it anyway. So I don't you. know what you're going to say. You know, after, so my <laughs> wife had Bella, and then she had a miscarriage, and there was weight gain and different things. And I remember being in my young 20s, and I remember being angry. Man, when I married Julie, she was so hot, da da da. She's let herself go. I'm so mad at her. And I'll never forget the Holy Spirit just convicted me so deeply. And he said, Mike, he said, your wife's body is a reflection of your words. You've abused your wife. You've spoken down. She's severely depressed. You're supposed to be the high priest of your home. You've got to go back to go forward. You've got to pray with her like you used to pray with her. You've got to prophesy to your wife. You've got to begin to speak in. Mike, you've lost the vision. When did you become so cruel? The old you would drive four hours, because me and Julie live 200 miles apart. You would drive four hours, 200 miles, take her out for dinner and drive four hours back. And now you won't even go pick her something out and pick her something up to eat. And she's now transformed. Julie is not gaining the weight because she's a bad person. She lost vision for her life. She's depressed. And it's your job to speak that vision. And I begin to prophesy over you. I begin to speak into your life. And then all of a sudden, Julie transformed in that season into a triathlete. But I heard the Lord say to somebody, there is still time, but you must go backward to go forward. When you first spoke to your wife, you didn't discourage her, you encouraged her. You were her biggest cheerleader. When you first got married, you had hope, you had, you had this desire to, and you had a future and God's gonna take you back to that place. And I think women, we have to, we have to allow space for them to be different. And here's how this looks in real life. You pray to God, Lord, soften his heart, right? Y'all pray this prayer. Change him. He's a psycho. I had to get you back for that one line. <laughs> <laughs> he won't stop cussing. And he comes home from work. You're still angry. He goes to grab your hand and you pull it away. Well, you, we didn't even talk about it. But you just rejected a bid for intimacy, a bid for emotional intimacy, yeah. a bid for change. And so a lot of times us women, we, they start making um, strides to be different. And, and if you're in a functional marriage, good for you. You get the award. I'm so happy for you. But I was in crazy dysfunction. So if you're, who's the kind of people who threw plates? Oh, hey, okay. Deliver her, Lord. It probably was him. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, I'm going to talk to my people then because y'all churchy over here. But like we would throw some, somebody broke something every single Saturday. I love to punch holes in the wall. Yes. And, and one time you punched that one hole that had the cement wall and I was like, good. You can't Hulk smash cement, you can't. guys. <laughs> yeah. But this is us being real because I'm being real. at that season in our life, we were ordained. Yeah. We were ministering, preaching to people, praying, but we had the fruits of the flesh, not the fruits, fruits of the of spirit. The flesh. And so we were stuck in a cycle. It's like even when he would try, I would just shut him down so hard. And I'm not talking about even intimacy. I'm talking about like, how was your day? Well, why are you asking about my day? Was, you never asked about my day all week. Am I, am I speaking to somebody? And so as women, somebody has to be the redeemer. Stop waiting for them. Yeah, come on. 
You don't have to wait, you know, well, it's 50-50. No, it ain't. The cross was not 50-50. I'll go to the cross if you repent. That's not Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going all the way whether you come or not. I'm going all the way because I'm in it. I am so in this thing. And sometimes with our marriage, women, let go of the past. I'll never forget it. If you've been stuck in a rehearse before, have you ever been that, the replay? I'm telling you, one day I was in church, in church, and the replay was just going out. We weren't lead pastors or nothing. We were just serving our local church. And, and, the, and the replay is just going in my head of what was said and what was done. And this woman of God, Adele, thank you, Lord, came up to me. She looked at my eyes and, and mind you, I'm just putting bulletins out, okay? I'm not doing anything serious. She looked at me and she said, the Lord told me to tell you what's done is done. Let it go. And it silenced the voice of the enemy. And from that day, I thought, anytime he makes an effort, I'm going all the way. Yeah. Here's the thing. I feel the, the anointing so strongly. It's time to go back. You're going to go back before you go forward. If, now listen, I'm talking to the women right now. Men are like mirrors. If you look into the mirror like this, a man will... Yeah. If you look in the mirror and you're like, mm-hmm, a man will go, <laughs> Men are like mirrors. What if I told you that if Julie's body was a reflection of my words, my behavior was a reflection of her behavior. Because Ju I would come home not realizing my wife prayed these satanic prayers that I would get into a car accident <laughs> on the way there. And so when I walked in the door, Julie wasn't saying, come on, come on, come on inside. Julie was looking at me like this. What you sow is what you reap. And it creates a cycle so Julie's look at me, looking at me, and here's the thing. If you treat your man like his past, he will manifest his past over and over and over again. If you treat him like the future, he will begin to manifest the vision that God showed him from the beginning because men are visual. And that's why pornography has wrecked the lives of so many men because it's not supposed to be pornography. It's supposed to be the prophetic. And if we are visual, that means we're visionaries. And that means that we can be in poverty but have a vision for our family that it's going to be from poverty to legacy. It means that we can have a vision where we can see that we can find finally actually have the family that we know that God's called you to. And so if the visual canceled our sexuality and canceled our hope and canceled our dream, it's the vision that'll resurrect it. So right now in this place, this is your wife. There are six or seven billion people on the planet. You said no to three billion women to say yes to one. That's your wife. That's the mother of your children. Did you know that science tells us that when you impregnate a woman, that there's stem cells from that baby that actually travel throughout the woman's body and end up in her brain and actually begins to intertwine with her neurons? Meaning that the, that the DNA of the father even begins to entwine with the brain of the mother. There's a oneness. If you have not divorced and you're sitting in that seat and you think that you're done, I want to remind you this is your bride. This is your bride. You got to go back. And God's gonna take you on a supernatural journey in the spiritual realm back to that moment. And he's gonna restore the years that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. God is gonna redeem every single situation. And mark my words, and we're, listen, we're getting ready for the next session. We're getting ready to pray in a few moments, but mark my words. Some of the things that you thought were gonna destroy your marriage are gonna become a weapon that's forged in your hands. 
Because see, first David, he rehearsed the victories of the past so that he could repeat a victory in the present. And he walked up to Goliath and took the same sword that Goliath was going to try to use to kill him. And he cut Goliath's head off and killed Goliath with his own sword. Everything that almost destroyed Julie and I's marriage becomes content for every conference for the rest of our lives. That's what redeem means. Redeem means that you come out of this conference tonight and you look your spouse in the eye and you say, I didn't think it was possible until tonight, but all of this becomes our testimony now. Oh, I feel the presence of God. You've got to go back to go forward. So grab this, the hand of your spouse right now. And just hold their hand across all 18 locations. Every spouse, just hold their hand. Just close your eyes to remove all distractions. Do you remember? Whew. Do you remember the first time you held this hand? This is your wife. This is your husband. If you're willing to go back and say, I, I, I want to go back to the beginning. I, I'm willing to go back. My body's changed. My mind's changed. My situation's changed. We've been through a lot, but I'm willing to go back. Would you just squeeze the hand of your spouse right now to tell them, I'm, I'm willing to go back. Somebody's being healed right now because they never thought that they would feel that squeeze. Come on, somebody wanted to do it, but you let pride get in the way. I'm gonna give you one more chance. If you're willing to go back, if you're willing to go back, just squeeze their hand now. Come on, let me pray. Father, I've done many, many marriage ceremonies, and we say this line, what God, what you join together, let no man divide. And Father, I thank you that something happened for some of us. It was months ago, years ago, when we joined together with our spouse and you brought us to this place, God, to take us back. And Lord, I thank you that if we felt the passion once, we can feel it again. If we felt the love once, we can feel it again. If we said it once, we can say it again. We are capable of going back. And Lord, I thank you that right now you're healing. You're freeing. You're breaking all the chains of unforgiveness. And Lord, I thank you that before this night is over, you're going to finish the process that you started now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.